that's my little story. Thanks for listening. Now I want you to listen to the best speaker in the world, and that's Todd DePastino. I was fortunate Midge Gilson, when she was well, took me to one of his breakfasts for the military. My own two brothers never talked about the military. They were in there. They never talked. I wish they could have heard these lectures. So Todd, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me this uh, Halloween week yes. uh, for a seasonally appropriate subject, the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. Uh, before we get to that, oh, and by the end of this talk, Mary might have some idea, and so would you, of why the Martins probably left New England. <laughs> yeah, good reason to want to leave. Um, but I want to, before I get to that, I do want to uh, talk about the Veterans Breakfast Club a little bit. I have our newsletter here, which has our schedule through December. As you can imagine, we are not doing any more face-to-face -face events, but we've moved everything online. We do them virtually. We had an event, our happy hour last night. You can see how we do it. We do it on Zoom, and then we simulcast on Facebook Live and on YouTube Live, and it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, obviously, it's not like sharing the in-person experience, uh, but there are some compensating virtues. We're able to get people from all over the world and all over the country. You have a 96-year-old from Maine who is a company commander in the Battle of Okinawa. He joins us every time. We have a World War II expert who lives on St. Lucia who joins us mostly every time. Uh, Sunday afternoon, we had a B-17 tail gunner uh, who ditched his plane and spent nine glorious months in Sweden uh, on his 23rd mission, the emergency landing. And we had somebody from Sweden who knows that whole story of his plane, and he was on. So there really is, is it, it, the person in yellow up at the top, she's 99-year-old, Navy Wave, Julia Parsons, she joins us every single time. Uh, it's really absolutely wonderful. Uh, we have them on a breakfast at 9 a.m., so tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., I'll be up in my attic on Zoom, and we'll be gathering, you know, sharing some stories. We have our happy hour, Monday night at 7, that's our most well-attended. We probably get about 120 people on, on Monday nights at, at 7. And then we have Greatest Generation Live, Sundays at 4. We compete most of the time with the Steelers. <laughs> but even so, this is the one that we really get people from around the world on because they want to hear, these are, we just focus on World War II veterans. We'll have a, vet, a World War II veteran or two on with somebody else who has a story to share about World War II. And it's ab just absolutely wonderful. We'll have B-Day veterans, Utah Beach veteran Warren Goss on this Sunday at 4 p.m. I encourage you to attend. Everybody's welcome to attend. You don't have to be a veteran to attend. We also have a video cast and a podcast called The Scuttlebutt. And if you were in the Navy, you'll understand what that means. Um, and that is, we talk for an hour about military headlines, you know, main big question that we want to address, like, you know, should you join the military? If so, which branch? Big questions like that. And then we share kind of like interesting inside information about the military. It's called the Scuttlebutt Understanding Military Culture. Again, we release that every Monday. So please do take one of these newsletters, join us if you can. It's so much fun. It really is. I mean, let's, let's see. Last night, and I, I've got to stop talking about this, but last night we had um, a Catholic nun who joined the Navy against her order's wishes. We had a, an Army captain who was involved in the invasion of Iraq in, in 2003. Uh, we had a, a Marine colonel who was involved in the Beirut uh, uh, operation in 1983. Um, we had six World War II veterans with us last night. It's just absolutely kind of never quite know what you're going to hear, so please do join us. It's a kind of a free-for-all, wonderful conversation. But I'm here to talk about the Salem Witch Trials, which is one of the most written about events in American history. I mean, maybe the most written about event in colonial American history. And the reason for that is two things converge with the Salem Witch Trials. First of all, there are well over a thousand really good documents pertaining to the Salem Witch Trial. So uh, we have plenty of material to describe what happened. But what we don't have is an explanation of why it happened. And when you have those things, when you have a mystery combined with a lot of sources, 
you have fodder for history books. So every year, new books are written about the Salem Witch Trials. Try to explain just what happened. You know, what happened? It, it's, it's stunning how this event kind of lives on in our, in our culture, in our imagination. We have a president who tweeted often about witch hunts. You know, that, about witch hunts against him. I mean, it lives, it, the, the term witch hunt lives on as a, uh, you know, as a, an allegory or a metaphor for unjust kind of prosecution or persecution. Uh, and it also lives on in our popular culture. If you go to Salem today, during, except for this year probably, during Halloween time, uh, there will be a million people there. They spend a hundred million dollars a year in Salem, Massachusetts around Halloween. I went to Boston College as an undergraduate. I spent one Halloween in Salem. I wish I could tell you what happened, but I don't remember that much. It was wacko. It was crazy. Um, but the story begins, the real history, the story begins on a cold uh, January morning in 1692 in uh, the parsonage of Reverend Samuel Paris who was the pastor of the first church of Salem Village. And one of the first things you should know, there's, here's the archaeological remains of the parsonage. If you want to go see those remains, you don't go to Salem. You go to Danvers, Massachusetts. This is where it gets a little confusing. There are actually two Salems. One is Salem Village, one is Salem Town. Salem Village changed its name to Danvers. The witch trials and all the witch history accusations occurred in Salem Village. Nothing occurred in Salem Town yet. That's where everybody goes every Halloween, you know, for, to learn about the Salem witch trials. Um, and what happened is, is uh, Samuel Paris had a daughter, Betty, nine years old, and uh, a niece who was living with them, Abigail Williams, 11 years old. And the two girls were experimenting with uh, fortune telling, you know, something that people have done for centuries, if not millennia, especially tweens and teen girls. They had a water, they were breaking eggs in the water, and they were looking at the formations of the eggs in the water, the shapes, to kind of see who they might marry. That was the idea. And Betty Paris looks in there and she sees the shape of a coffin. And she gets scared. She gets spooked. She starts to shake. She starts to cry, she starts to wail, uh, she starts to scream, she gets on all fours and starts to bark, she starts convulsing as if she's having a seizure, and it took hours for them to kind of calm Betty down. They finally did. The next morning, her cousin, Abigail, she starts doing the same thing, shaking, convulsing. Many witnesses said, like, uh, their, their bodies were moving in unusual contortions. They were able to turn their hand all the way around, for example. Um, they brought a doctor in to examine the girls. They knew what epilepsy was in 1692, and they knew this wasn't it. And uh, the, the doctor kind of examined them and said, the girls clearly have been afflicted. They've been bewitched somehow. Word spread in Salem Village that the girls had been bewitched, and sure enough, two other girls came down with them. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Hubbard, who was the doctor's charge, she was actually the doctor's niece, but she was an orphan, so the doctor was her guardian. And this is important, that they were both orphans. And then Anne Putnam, Jr. She is such an important part of this story. Anne Putnam, Jr., 12 years old, she ended up accusing 62 people of being witches, more than anybody else. Her father accused probably about 43, somewhere between 40 and 50, Thomas Putnam. Anne Putnam Jr. is a really important part of the story. She's also interesting for this reason, to me. She's the only female I've ever heard of that has Jr. at the end of her name. If anybody can explain why, I'd love to hear it. I've never, I've never seen an explanation of why that is, why she's called Anne Putnam Jr., but that's how she appears in the sources. Um, Reverend Samuel Paris asked the four girls, oh, and then later church on Sunday, just about every girl in church came down with some kind of trembling or twitching. Uh, and, and so clearly, you know, this was, uh, girls were being bewitched and afflicted, but they didn't know who was doing it. So Samuel Paris asked the girls, 
who is doing this to you? And all four girls answered in unison, Sarah Osborne, Sarah Good, and Tichaba. Very quickly, they named these three, girl, these three women as being the witches. This is a first clue. This is a first clue what's going on. 75% of all the people accused were women. So something's going on with women in Puritan New England at this time. There were 178 people accused in 1692 and 1693. 178 names we know of, of the accused. There were an additional two or 300 who, uh, whose names have been lost to us, but we know they were accused. So 75% are women. So most of, you're more likely to be accused if you're a woman. There were men accused, but almost all of them were men who were defending women who had been accused. So they were husbands defending their wives. They were brothers defending sisters, you know, sons defending mothers, that kind of a thing. But you were more likely to be accused if you were a woman. And, you know, womanhood in Puritan New England was very severe and strict. There, women were very much confined and contained in Puritan New England. And it was, for example, it, you really couldn't be a single woman in Puritan New England. You would grow up being the property of your father, and then when you came of age, you would become the property of your husband. And for really, you couldn't own property, you couldn't sign contracts, of course you couldn't vote. You know, you really had no rights. And um, but there was one loophole. <laughs> this is a good, interesting loophole. If you were a woman and got married, you couldn't, you know, no property could be in your name or anything. But if you were a woman and got married, and you were lucky enough to have your husband die, <laughs> you would be in charge of his property until your son came of age, 18 years old. So you had that window where you had some power. That's exactly what had happened to Sarah Osborne. This was really frowned upon. If you, when your husband died, the Puritans like got together and they wanted you to get married right away again. Because a single woman was just not trusted. It was a threat to the social order. Sarah Osborne, her house is still here in Danvers. You can see, she was wealthy. Her husband was uh, Robert Prince. He uh, had been a merchant. He had Acquired a lot of money, he died. She took control of the treasure, and she had a son who was under 18, and the expectation was that, of course, when her son turned 18, he would take over the property and she would step back. What she did instead is, as the son was approaching 18, Sarah uh, acquired an indentured servant, a male, from Ireland, who lived with her. Rumors spread that they were more than mistress and servant, if you know what I mean. And sure enough, on the eve of the son's 18th birthday, they get married. So the Irish servant acquires kind of legal control of the property, but everybody knew that Sarah Osborne was really controlling the purse strings. She was finding a way around, you know, these restrictions on women. Um, the other thing against her was that she had not gone to church for three years. Oh boy, Puritan New England, that ain't good. I mean, you have to go to church. You have only ten percent or so of the of the people who lived in Puritan New England were members, were church members. But everybody, by law, had to go to church. By law, everybody did twice a week. Didn't matter if you you didn't have to believe it, you didn't have to be saved, but you ha absolutely had to go to church. The only way you could not go to church is if you were sick. Sarah Osborne was sick for three years. <laughs> she didn't go. So she was accused of being a witch, and she was held in jail, chained to a wall, and before she could be tried, she died in jail. Turns out she really was sick, I guess. The second one accused, Sarah Good, she was like the, <clears throat> the stereotype you would think of a witch. Uh, she's depicted in the literature as like an old had an older woman, but she, she was 39 years old. In fact, she was pregnant when she was uh, when she was tried. She was nobody liked her. She would kind of walk around town, asking for a place to stay. She was homeless. She was kind of a vagrant. She would ask for food. She would talk to herself. She would be what we would diagnose as probably schizophrenic. 
today. She was severely mentally ill. She had a four-year-old daughter, Dorothy, with her. And she would, you know, it was really, everybody hated her. And she would, you know, she would knock on a door and say, can I stay in your house tonight? And you would say no, you know, and turn her away. And, and so she would then mutter to herself as she walked away. Everybody had a story about how they would walk past her on the street and should be muttering, should mutter something at them. And everybody knew or thought that Sarah Good was muttering a curse. So, you know, you'd be walking down the street one day, Sarah Good, you'd pass Sarah Good, should mutter something under her breath that you didn't quite catch. The next day, lightning would strike your barn. You know? Your, your cow would run, run dry. Obvious case of witchcraft. Uh, she, in court, said, I never muttered curses. They said, well, what are you muttering? And she said, the Ten Commandments. And the judge said, name them. She couldn't name any. <laughs> uh, so she was tried, she was found guilty, and she was the first accused witch to be hanged. And she was hanged. They allowed her to give birth to her baby, who died, and then they hanged her. She was the first to hang, you know? And when she, uh, but they, before she was killed, she said, you're a liar. I'm no more a witch than you are a wizard. If you take my life away, God will give you blood to drink. Oh, boy. I think the people of Salem Village were kind of happy to get rid of her. The most fascinating of, these, of, of the accused is absolutely Tichaba. Tichaba was a genius. She changed everything, and I'll tell you how. Tichaba was a slave. She's often depicted as African, but she wasn't. She was an Indian probably an Arawak Indian, probably from present-day Venezuela. Uh, she had been, Samuel Paris had been a sugar plantation owner on Barbados in the 1670s. He got wiped out in a hurricane in 1680, came to New England. But while he was in Barbados, he fought Tichaba, uh, who, who was an Arawak Indian, brought her up to Salem when he became the pastor of the First Church of Salem Village. Um, Tichaba, you can see from the record, she doesn't speak, English is not her native language. There was also another slave in the household, a guy named John Indian. It's probably true that John Indian and Tichaba were, were husband and wife. Tichaba is fascinating. She gets, you know, she goes to court, she gets tried, she gets accused of being a witch, and she denies it. You know, she denies it. And uh, then she goes home after the first day of the, of the hearing and gets beaten by Samuel Paris saying, if you confess, maybe we'll have mercy on you. So she shows up for the second day of trial, and you have to picture this. This is a small courtroom in Salem Village, packed with every single member of the village, 300 people, easily, packed in this courtroom. There are girls in the courtroom writhing on the ground in pain, as if they're being pricked or stabbed, right? Because they're being bewitched during the court proceedings. Everybody's eyes are on Tichaba. The, the judge in charge of the case, John Hathorne, who is Nathaniel Hawthorne's great-great-grandfather. Nathaniel Hawthorne changed his name, added a W, because he was so ashamed of his great-great-grandfather, he didn't want any association with him. John Hathorne is there kind of grilling Tichaba. She denies it, and then she clearly remembers what Samuel Parrott says, and she changes her tune. She's, uh, uh, um, he asks, he asks uh, you know, did you never see the devil? And Tichaba said, the devil came to me and bid me serve him. That was it. This changed everything. She confessed. And I won't go through everything that she says here. It's really fascinating, though, if you want to read her account in court, it's so obvious that John Hathorne is leading the witness, he's badgering the witness, he's suggesting things like, you know, uh, was there a book? Did the devil have a book? She says, yeah, the devil had a book. What was written in there? Um, lots of things were written in there. What was it written with? It was written with blood. I mean, you know what, she's just making this stuff up. Like in front of 300 people, kind of following where he wants her to go, and she spins this elaborate tale of a man who appears to her. He has a yellow bird, and he says, I'll give you this yellow bird and many other pretty things if you serve me for six years. And um, 
Uh, he has her sign a book. In the book are names. What did you see any of the names? Yes. Can you name any of the names? She said, Yeah, uh, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. <laughs> you know, that's a gimme. Any other names? She said, No, I can't remember the other names. How many names were there? She says, Nine. This breaks the case wide open. Think about this. There are two lessons that are drawn from Tichuba's uh, testimony. One for the prosecution, one for the defense. Uh, for the prosecution, it was clear. Tichuba's testimony showed this was not a limited case. This was not a one-off uh, or a three-off with you know a couple crazy witches who are afflicting some girls. This is a vast conspiracy led by Satan to overthrow Puritan New England and replace it with the kingdom of Satan here in North America. That's what this was about. This was, and, and, we, and nobody knew how far it went. The judges knew there were seven, seven other witches out there, but they didn't know who they were. So they had to go on a witch hunt to find them before they destroyed Puritan New England. For the defense, the lesson is easy. If you confess, you'll be spared. Tichabo was spared. If you confess and name names, you will not be hanged. And so what do you think happens? As people get accused, they start singing like canaries, you know? Uh, William Barker confesses that the devil's design was to destroy Salem Village, to begin at the minister's house, and to destroy the church of God, and set up Satan's kingdom. He says that when he's accused of being a wizard. Deliverance Hobbs confesses that she learned that there were some 300 or more witches in the county, and their, their object was the destruction of Salem Village. So now the number has gone up from nine witches to 300. Uh, Abigail Hobbs confesses that Mr. Burroughs, who is a, he's a minister, he's a former minister actually in Salem Village, who is accused of being a witch. They find him in Maine, they bring him to Salem, they hang him. And she says that Mr. Burroughs had a trumpet which he blew to summon the witches to their feasts near Mr. Paris's house. This completely changes. If Tichuba had simply done what she was supposed to do, which is deny it, be hanged, and die, then I wouldn't be here talking about the Salem Witch Trials. It would have been a footnote in American history. There, would have, there had been some witch trials before, not many. There had been some witches, accused witches hanged, but not many. This would have been another kind of strange little thing that happened in Salem where three women were accused of being witches and were hanged, but it wouldn't have become the major thing it did become. It's all because Tichuba confessed and named names. It became, it expanded well beyond Salem. I mean, the accusations went all through New England, all the way north to Maine, all the way west to Bellarica. There were, what, 45 witch trials in Andover? Massachusetts, and one historian says it should be called the Andover Witch Trials, because there was so much more action there than actually in Salem. Uh, this was a big deal, and by the time it was all over, a little over a year later, 19 people had been hanged as witches, five accused had died in prison, including Dorothy Good, that four-year-old daughter of Sarah Good, she was chained to a wall for eight months. No, she didn't die. She lived. She was chained, a four-year-old girl who was forced to testify against her mother, was chained and was accused of being a witch. She was chained to a wall for eight months, was released, and of course had a horrific life afterwards. By the way, Sarah Goods, she was married. She had a second husband. They were estranged. William Good showed up. They, they found William Good. They brought him into to the trial as a character witness. And they asked him, is Sarah a witch? And he said, oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so five people die in prison awaiting trial. 19 get hanged. One, famously, a man named Giles Corey, gets pressed to death with stones. He technically wasn't executed. <laughs> he, um, he was being tortured to, uh, to say he, he, could, he wouldn't plead. He refused to cooperate. His wife, Martha, had been accused of being a witch. He was very vocal in defending her. So they dragged him into court. They accused him of being a wizard. And they dragged him into court, and he refused to plead. He said, I won't have anything to do with this court proceeding. 
So he wouldn't say guilty or not guilty. And so they laid him on a plank, they put another plank on top of him, and over two days they just put more and more stones on the plank, getting him to plea. He still wouldn't plea. His last words were more weight after two days. Uh, he's often depicted, and rightly so, as being unbelievably courageous. So, uh, you know, not re refusing to plea to save his wife. Um, and I hate to burst the bubble, but it's very true. I've done some reading on Giles Corey. He was a murderer. Yeah, he murdered two people at least. He was a really violent SOB. And I think that's why uh, he was kind of singled out for, for persecution. Um, you know, historians have spent the last 300 years trying to find correlations between the accused and the accusers. They've been trying to find patterns. What is driving the accusations? Why are certain people being accused? Why are other people doing making the accusations? What's motivating all this? And it turns out there are more patterns than we, we could cover here, you know, in this, this evening. Uh, a book came out a few years ago that I think is pretty darn convincing that um, most of the accusers had been sexually assaulted at some point in their lives. Most of the accusers who were women. Um, that I think they show that kind of beyond doubt. Uh, I'll, I'll you know mention a couple here, major correlations. There's a major correlation between people who suffered in Indian wars and who accused others of being witches. The Indian Wars in Puritan New England over the previous 20 years before the witch trials were some of the bloodiest ever fought in North America. They were horrific. It was like a Native American tribe would come in and, you know, literally like chop up every resident of a village. The Puritans then would raid the Indian village and kill every single one of them. I mean, it was ab just absolute murder, you know. And, uh, and it turns out, almost all the accusers had lost close family members in Indian Wars. And they had seen family members die. So there's a lot of research about post-traumatic stress and some of these family members. Uh, Mercy Lewis, for example, she was an accuser. Every single member of her family, every single one, all her grandparents, her cousins, her aunts and uncles, her parents, her brothers and sisters were all killed by Indians in front of her. She was the only survivor. She accused a lot of people of being witches. A lot. The people who were accused of being witches tended overwhelmingly not to be involved in Indian wars. They lived in safer places, away from where the Native Americans were living, they had not lost family members in the Indian Wars. Rebecca Nurse is probably the, is the best example of that. Rebecca Nurse was the big shocker. That accusation came in July 1692. Rebecca Nurse, a resident of Salem Village, 71-year-old grandmother. Most people agreed that she was the most pious person in the village. Sweet, lovely grandmother. She was accused of being a witch. Nobody could believe it. She was tried, found guilty, and hanged. Her last words were like, I must have done something for God to do this to me, but I'm not a witch. She, no member of her family had ever been involved in an Indian war. She hadn't lost anybody. Another correlation that's really interesting, I'll just talk briefly about it, is um, the vast majority of people who were accused of being witches, vast majority of people had Quakers or Baptists in their family? Yeah. <laughs> Finally, we have somebody who understands how horrible that is. Um, that's almost as bad, not quite, but almost as bad as having a Roman Catholic in your family. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, we think, we, I think we tend to, you know, look like, what's the big deal with Quakers and Baptists? They were absolutely the most uh, disruptive, rowdy, radical, religious zealots in Puritan New England. They were as heterodox as you could be. They were heretics. They were considered heretics by the Puritans. 
They were increasingly protected by the British crown. And so more and more were coming into Puritan New England. They were disrupting society. They were intermarrying with Puritan families. They were doing business with Puritans. And overwhelmingly, those who were accused had Quakers or Baptists as relations, or friends, or neighbors. Rebecca Nurse, once again, had, had married into, or members of her family had married into a Baptist family. So that's a huge correlation. Um, so who were the Puritans? Boy, I love the Puritans. I'm like the only person in America that loves the Puritans. Uh, my, when I would teach this core, when I would teach this subject, I teach American history. I taught American history in college. By the end of the semester, my students hated two groups of people, Nazis, and Puritans. <laughs> no matter what I said, I could not convince them that Puritans were interesting, worthy people. They were strange. They were religious radicals in England. They believed that the Church of England, the Anglican Church, had to be stripped, eradicated, purified of anything smacking of Roman Catholicism. All the rituals, all the ceremonies, all the practices, all the adornments of Roman Catholic churches should be removed from church. Worship should go back to the Bible. If it ain't in the Bible, it should not be in worship. And they were really strict about it, and they wanted the government, because remember the Anglican Church, the Church of England was the church, the official church of the government of England. They wanted the Anglican Church to enforce this. There weren't many Puritans at first. They were a a loud, rowdy minority, and man, did the English people hate them. They were like buzz crushers. You know, um, H.L. Mencken said, Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. Here's a cartoon on the left. These are Puritans enjoying a really good laugh. <laughs> this is a cartoon from 1833, and there are lots of cartoons from the 1650s, 1640s against Puritans. English people generally hated the Puritans. Uh, here's a cartoon from 1833. This is a Puritan who's hanging a cat because the cat caught a mouse on Sunday. Here's a Puritan uh, in 1901 from a magazine cover. This is the Pan American Exposition that was in Buffalo, New York that year. And he's horrified not only that the exposition is open on Sunday, but that Niagara Falls dares to fall on Sunday. Uh, you know. So the Puritans were super radical and really religious. And they established these Church of England churches that were unlike, I think, any church any of us have ever been in. Certainly, I grew up a Roman Catholic. I can't imagine a church being like this. They were really plain buildings. No stained glass. No crosses. No gilded candles or anything, uh, no kneelers, simple benches without backs, because if you have a back, what happens? You might be comfortable, right? And you might fall asleep in church. It's hard to stay awake in church. Church on Sunday is five or six hours long. The sermon is the centerpiece. Two hours at least. I would have been a Puritan minister. In 1692, given two hours to talk about something I'm interested in. It was women on this side, men on this side. But then you had to go to church on Wednesday night also. That was shorter, that was two or three hours. Uh, the, the sermon was always an a intense interpretation, or as they say, exegesis, of, um, of, a, of a scriptural passage explained in plain English what it means. So these Puritan ministers were real, were the first American intellectuals. Uh, they were really devoted to reading and understanding the Bible. Um, but, oh, this is a, you could go today to Hingham, Massachusetts, and see the old ship meeting house, which is the, you know, the last or the oldest Puritan meeting house in America. That ain't what it looked like in 1681. That has been, like, remodeled and updated and fancified and, you know, adorned as the restrictions were removed. Puritan churches were unwhitewashed, bare wood. No, it would be maybe a riser for the for the speaker, but that's it. 
Uh, the temperature in the winter was kept at 45 degrees to keep people awake so that you wouldn't get too comfortable. Uh, I mean, this was really a severe religion. No incense, no stained glass, no altar, no vestments, no kneeling, no blessing yourself, no closing your eyes when you pray, uh, no even folding your hands together when you pray. Uh, there were no bishops or priests, um, uh, you know, no bells, no music, no paintings or pictures, no crosses, no sacraments, no liturgy, of course. Uh, there were a few sacraments, but they weren't very, very serious. It was essentially undoing everything that the Roman Catholic Church had introduced into the Christian religion. And they were especially harsh about holidays. Puritans hated holidays. They said, for they for whom all days are holy can have no holiday. Every day is a holy day. You know? They especially hated, and this is what gave them a really bad reputation, they especially hated Christmas. Hated it. Uh, you know, you've heard about the war on Christmas. The Puritans were the first to attack Christmas, and attack it they did. They, in New England, Puritans in New England, Christmas was banned. You were not permitted to celebrate it. Uh, Christmas, and they argued, and they were right. There's no biblical justification for Christmas. Show me where in the Bible you're supposed to put up a tree and drink and, you know, play lawn uh, bowling in the streets which is what English people did on Christmas. It was a day off work, they exchanged gifts, they drank in the streets, they played games, and then they fought, and then they went to bed. What's wrong with that? The Puritans thought there was no biblical... The Puritans argued it's a pagan holiday that the Roman Catholic Church put a thin veneer of Christian, you know, uh, observance over just to recruit people into the church. There's no biblical basis for it. Same thing with Easter. Same thing for weddings. Marriage was not a Christian rite in Paris and New England. It was purely a civil matter. The church was not involved. No wedding rings. Nobody wore wedding rings. That was banned. Uh, this is really severe, and of course, English people hated the Puritans who wanted to ban uh, Christmas because everybody loved Christmas. Oh, I love on the bottom here, Samuel Sewell was a great, uh, wonderful, brilliant Puritan preacher, and he writes in his journal, Somebody gave me, from England, somebody sent me a calendar. And the first thing I did was blot out Valentine's Day. <laughs> you know, Easter, the Assumption, uh, Christmas, Michaelmas. Um, you know, just getting rid on that calendar of all the, all the holidays. I want you to look at, oh, this book here is a satire. It's an examination and trial of Old Father Christmas. By, you know, it's a, it's a satire of the Puritans. Uh, and then here's a public notice about Christmas being forbidden. Uh, I want you to look at this cartoon. It's wonderful. Here in the middle is Father Christmas walking into a town. And Santa Claus says, Sir, I bring you good cheer. And the man on the left is a Puritan. He says, Keep out. You come not here. And then the man on the right, he's just an ordinary Englishman. He says, Old Christmas, welcome. Do not fear. This is from 1653 a book in 1653, again, making fun of the Puritans. But look at the cartoon. Look how the Puritan is depicted and how the ordinary Englishman is depicted. Uh, the man on the right is just a simple farmer. He's got a basket at the end of a stick. You know, he's a plain cloth hat, uh, not much adornment. The man on the left has a much more expensive hat. He's got a feather coming out of it. He has lace. On his on his uh, on his pants, um, he has seems to have a ceremonial sword. He's better dressed. This was deliberate, absolutely deliberate. Puritans were urban in an overwhelmingly rural country of England of the 17th century. Puritans were overwhelmingly urban. They lived in towns and cities. If they were farmers. They farmed on the side, but they also were accountants, bankers, merchants, lawyers, of course, ministers. They tended to collect into professions. In a, in a country where there was maybe 30% literacy, all Puritans knew how to read and write. All of them. You could not be a Puritan and know, not know how to read the Bible. 
You had to be. That was a requirement. So Puritans were educated. They were urban. They tended to be wealthy. They had money. Um, and so even though that they were few in number, they had an outsized influence on the culture. Because we all know what a well-organized minority can do in a culture. They can really change it. You know, by, by if they have access to media channels and they're able to get their message out, they can have an influence far beyond their numbers. And that's exactly what the Puritans did. The monarchs of England were never, were never really friendly to the Puritans. James I was kind of friendly. He wanted to make nice with the Puritans, so he commissioned uh, a Bible, the King James Bible, that would be a vernacular version of the Bible, not the Latin version. But King James' son, Charles I, the guy that they here, he was really a closet Catholic. He had married a Catholic. I think he converted to Catholicism right before his execution. I could be wrong about that. And he started persecuting the Puritans. So in 1630, the first shipload of Puritans came across the Atlantic Ocean and arrived in New England, Salem Harbor, aboard the Arabella. And aboard the Arabella, uh, John Winthrop, who would become the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, he gave a sermon, even before they touched land, saying that uh, we shall be as a city on a hill, all people's eyes will be on us. They were really looking to establish a utopian society here in North America. That was their mission, to live by God's law here in America. And they thought that by establishing a godly commonwealth here in America, they could change the world. You know, they could, they could change and right the world. Um, after that first ship, the Arabella came, landed in 1630, over the next 10 years, 20,000 more Puritans would follow. It's called the Great Migration. And they began their experiment. Wow, did they succeed. I mean, I don't know if there's ever been a utopian community or any society that took off so quickly, so successfully than Puritan New England. I mean, certainly, just in terms of wealth, I mean, they immediately were successful uh, in the fur trade, timber, fish. But within 10 years, they're already diversifying into all kinds of things, shipbuilding, and they're involved in, in, in trade with uh, the Caribbean. I mean, they start rivaling the mother country in manufactured goods. They're that prosperous. They certainly were a lot better than that miserable colony in the South, Virginia, where people just died and died and died and died. You know, and it took them like 30, 50 years to even have you know, one generation live. Um, that was not that way in Puritan New England, man. They were, God was absolutely smiling on their experiment. They were rich, and they were living longer. This does not get covered enough in the history books. They were living longer than any group of people on earth. People would move to New England and they would live into their 70s, 80s, and 90s routinely. The, you know, the, the average age of death back in England was 35 years old. If you made it into your 20s, you had a decent chance to make it into your 50s, maybe. But in New England, you move there, you live to your 80s. Most people lived into their 70s. It was just stunning. People didn't quite, it was clear that God again was blessing them. Also, in a world, you know, in, in, in old England, I said 30% of the population was literate, maybe, maybe 40% by 1650. In New England, 100%. Even slaves knew how to read and write, by law. Their masters had to teach them, by law. Husbands had to teach their wives, by law, if the wives didn't know how to read and write. Everybody had to be able to read the rough. The Bible. So you have the one of the, you know what do they do when they arrive in New England? I mean, within six years they found Harvard College to train the ministers. That's how important learning is. They do science experiments. The Puritans are real intellectuals, and uh, they're really committed to learning about the natural world and to figuring out the natural world. Um, so Puritan New England was enormously successful, and this is the complicated part of the story, I think. They were too successful. 
I think that was their downfall. <laughs> it, it sounds crazy, but they were too successful. They started getting wealthy. They started building big homes. They started attracting people like the Bartons, who were coming to New England not for religion, but to make a buck. That's what I'm guessing. Either that or he's a nasty Baptist or Quaker. <laughs> you need to research that. Um, you know, people are coming into New England now with, with monetary motives, with financial motives, or, they, or maybe they were religious, but they were also just benefiting from you know, economic growth, and they were building houses like the one on the lower right, the House of Seven Gables that Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote about. Here's the John Ward House in Salem. You can still see it today. People like this guy, John Freak, that's his name, uh, in, this, in this portrait in, in 1671, you know, he's a second generation Puritan migrant. He's an attorney, he's a merchant, he's a shipbuilder. He's a brewer, he's a miller. He trades in slaves, he trades in rum. He sends finished goods back to England as well as raw materials. He's buying a lot of things, consumer goods, from Europe, and he's showing it off in this portrait. 24 silver buttons, you know, uh, an expensive velvet coat, uh, crenulated cuffs. He has a lace collar from Venice, and he's touching with his left hand. I think he's holding with his right hand some expensive gloves. You're supposed to be impressed by that. And then he's touching with his left hand a silver, did you say brooch or brooch? Brooch? Brooch. Silver brooch. He's kind of showing it off. And this was becoming typical. There really was a wealthy class growing in Salem town, especially. And Puritan, old line Puritan ministers were not happy about it. Increasingly in the 1650s, 1660s, you, you're one of these wealthy guys like John Creek, you're going to church. Oh man, that minister is giving a two hour sermon and he's shooting daggers at you about how the, the colony is going to hell in a handbasket. You know, we're getting too soft, we're getting too rich, we're, we're going after earthly goods, we've lost our way. It, it's, it's, it becomes a, a, a very common Puritan theme in sermons, and here's one from John Higginson in 1663. He says, I'll quote it at length. My brothers and my fathers and brethren, this is never to be forgotten that New England is originally a plantation of religion, not a plantation of trade. Let merchants and such that are increasing cent for cent remember this. Let others that have come over since understand this. That worldly gain was not the end and design of the people of New England, but religion. And if any man amongst us makes religion as twelve, and the world is thirteen, let such a one know he hath neither the spirit of a true New England man, nor yet of a sincere Christian. So there's a lot of criticism of the, there's a growing divide, I think, between those who want to adhere to the old time religion, of the heroic generation that arrived between 1630 and 1640, and the more worldly, secular, liberal, tolerant, you know, materialistic second and third generation. It's really, really growing, and you could see it in the witch trials. And this, I think, for me, this is the major underlying motivation behind the witch trials. And you can see it in this map behind me. You can see it very clearly. Uh, this is a map of Salem Village, outlined, the orange part outlined there. Uh, Salem Town is down here by the harbor. Here's Salem Village. Here is a line, a dotted line, dividing West Salem Village from East Salem Village. All the A's represent accusers. Somebody, this is where they lived. Accusers who accused people of being witches. All the W's represent people who were accused of being witches. And all the D's represent people who defended those who were accused of being witches. Look at this map. Something's going on here. You know? 
30 of the 32 accusers live on the west or left side of that dotted line. 12 of the 14 witches live on the east or the right side of that dotted line. And 24 of the 29 defenders also live on the east. There's something dividing east and west Salem village. Something's going on here. Like something profound. This is a village divided. And, uh, and sure enough, I think it's not that hard to explain. It, the division comes from the patterns of settlement in Puritan New England. When the first people come over from uh, the old world, they settle where the harbor is the best, where the roads are the best, or the, where the places for roads are the best, where there are navigable rivers, where there is a good location to build a fort that won't flood, and that will protect you from Native Americans, and a good place to build a meeting house. And, then, and, 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 you know, prosperous fields around it. And that's where the first people, when they settle in, that's where they settle. You know, they take up all that good land. And that's what happened with the Arabella that landed in 1630. The members of the, of the first great migration who came in the, you know, 10 years between 1630 and 1640, they settled in Salem Town right near that wonderful harbor, and they were able to right away get involved in trade for that reason. Shipbuilding, they were able to you know, go to roads up north to, uh, to Boston and, and, and navigable rivers. Then later generations or later immigrants, when they come, they have to move further west. That's the eastern part of Salem Village. They're still close enough to Salem Town to be able to take advantage of the commercial opportunities that Salem Town has to offer. They're along good roads, they're along good rivers, uh, and they're close enough to the meeting house and to the, to the port where they're safe. But then even later arrivals have to move to the west part of Salem Village. And that is, you know, that's just too far away. It's a day's walk to the meeting house in Salem Town. Uh, it's a day's walk easily to market. Uh, there just aren't the amenities in the western part of the village. Therefore, people who lived on the west side of Salem Village, they were living very much like those original Puritans were living in the 1630s. A good, healthy, subsistence way of life. Nothing fancy. They weren't starving to death but they were not taking advantage of the great commercial opportunities that Puritan New England had to offer because they lived too far away from the good roads and good rivers and the good harbor. You know? They were kind of more backwards, more rural. Whereas the people uh, on the east side of, of Salem Village, they were closer to the town. They lived, Look how many lived along this road, at Switch Road. Topsfield Road, you know, they owned taverns, they owned inns, they owned shops where they sold things to migrants. Maybe those migrants were Baptists, maybe they were Quakers. You know, they, they interacted, they were involved in trade and shipbuilding. Um, look at that. So many witches and defenders live along these roads. Do you know where the roads out west this road leads to Indians. It really didn't lead to anything. That river, the Ipswich River, is not navigable. You can't sail a ship on it. So these people here are more vulnerable to Indian attack, and they can't, they don't take advantage of the commercial opportunities that Salem had to offer. Uh, it, the, the two great founding families of Salem Village, they are, in many ways you can say, that the Salem Witch Trials really comes down to a family feud between the Putnams and the Porters. They're both founding families, they're both big, they're respected, they were early settlers in Salem Village. Uh, they, have, they, they control a lot of land and a lot of businesses, but man, did they hate each other. They sued each other all the time over water rights mainly, but you know, sawmills and inheritances and things like that. Um, Almost everybody in Salem who's accused of being a witch has a connection to the Porter family. Almost everybody who makes an accusation has a connection to the Putnam family. Thomas Putnam alone, you know, accuses, say, 40 to 50 people 
of being witches. His daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, Ann Putnam Jr., accuses 62 people of being witches, 70, 17 of whom were executed. So this is a family feud. The Putnams are not as wealthy as the Porters. They're doing okay, but they're living a much more traditional life than the Porters are. The Porters are much more involved in commercial trade. The whole Salem Witch Trial fiasco grinds to a halt in March 1693 when the accusations go all the way up to the top to Governor Phipps's wife. That was one witch too far, and uh, so the governor says he puts an end to the special court, he calls an end to witch trials, and he does something really interesting. I'm really interested in this. Almost immediately after the witch trial stopped, everybody in New England realized something terrible has happened. We should be ashamed of ourselves. And the governor imposes a ban of three years. Nobody's allowed to talk about it or write about it a three-year pulling off period. At the end of the three years, there is a day of uh, fast and repentance, January 15, 1697, where all of New England goes to church and they pray to God for forgiveness for what they've done. It's intense. The first book is written that same year, uh, a, a modest inquiry into the nature of witchcraft by John Hale. John Hale had been a supporter of the witch trials until his wife Sarah was accused. <laughs> then he turned against them, and he wrote this expose about the witch trials. Uh, so there is a kind of a shock and a horror and an embarrassment in New England for generations over this. The families of those who were executed sue the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The lawsuits go on for 50 years and they were paid reparations for their loss. Um, there, there's a great guidebook, I remember running across a guidebook in graduate school, uh, written in the 1880s, that said, it was about New England, and it said, if you go to Salem, enjoy the town, but don't mention the witch trials because the residents are very sensitive about it. <laughs> so I mean, that's 200 years later. So it's still very, it was still at the time, uh, very sensitive, so sensitive that Salem Village decides to change their name to Danvers to escape the infamy of the witch trials. And I often think, when I think about this time of year and what happens in Salem today, Salem, Massachusetts today, uh, the amount of money that comes into Salem, I often wonder if the Salem Village regret that choice, <laughs> that nobody goes to Danvers to spend their money at Halloween. I mean, you know, in Salem, I. My father-in-law lives in Gloucester, Massachusetts, so I've gone to Gloucester every summer for you know 25 years, and uh, I've gone to Salem many times. And it's amazing how that town just embraces the legacy of the witch trials. That you know they saw the patch on the town patch is a witch on a broomstick. They have an Elizabeth Montgomery bewitched uh, statue in town. Uh, the the you know the football team is called the Witches. I mean they really embrace it, and it's uh, they're really the backbone of the economy. I do want to, if you let me talk for another minute, I, I want to end with, I think, one of the most poignant uh, documents relating to the witch trials that comes years later from Ann Putnam Jr. Ann Putnam Jr. had a really sad life. After the witch trials, her father Thomas died, her mother died, and she, being the oldest of 15 children, raised them. You know, beginning at age 14, she never married, she would die young, and in 1706, she went to her church and said that she wanted to repent for what she did during, during the witch trials. And you have to imagine that, again, this church being packed and her standing before the church and reading her confession. And this is what she said. I desire to be humble before God for that sad and humbling providence that befell my father's family in the year about 92. That I, then being in my childhood, should, by such a providence of God, be made an instrument for the accusing of several persons of a grievous crime, whereby their lives were taken away from them, whom now I have just grounds and good reason to believe they were innocent persons, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that, deleted, that deceived me in that sad time. And particularly, as I was the chief instrument 
of accusing good wife Rebecca Nurse and her two sisters, I desire to lie in the dust, to be humbled for it, in that I was a cause with others of so sad a calamity to them and their families, for which cause I desire to lie in the dust, and earnestly beg forgiveness of God, and from all those unto whom I have given just cause of sorrow and offense, whose relations were taken away or accused. She read this confession, uh, this plea for forgiveness, in uh, August 25th, 1706, and uh, the church records indicate that the entire congregation stood up and embraced her and forgave her. And I think, yes, the Puritans are the source of maybe a lot of bad in American culture, but they're also, I think, a source of great forgiveness in our culture and the great American uh, ideal of the second chance. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Um, did they ever figure out what caused the girls to do that, you know, go in the cell? Or uh, yeah. Um, if it was what, what we might call mass hysteria or mass uh, conversion uh, syndrome, where the power of suggestion, you could, you could get physical symptoms. If it's suggested by peers, you're very close, you have a strong emotional tie to. If they start experiencing symptoms, you could experience those symptoms. Um, it sounds strange, but it still happens, and it does happen a lot. The most, fam the most e the easiest to understand is the yawn. If I yawn, somebody here is going to yawn. Even if you say the word yawn, you want to yawn. Um, and that's... It, there, was a, there was a case several years ago in New York in a high school. I don't know if you remember this. I followed it really closely because of this. There was a, a case in a high school where um, a bunch of 16-year-old girls started having seizures like this, like these girls were having. Uh, they were experiencing pink pinpricks. They evacuated the school. They brought in you know, all kinds of technicians who looked for toxins. And they, finally, they brought in a school psychologist or a psychologist to interview all the kids and said, yeah, this is mass, mass conversion anxiety. It's, what the, it's mass hysteria. And man, the parents don't want to hear that. But I'm sure that's absolutely what happened. Yeah? Uh, we've been there, I think, three times. And they told about uh, in that, that summer, the, uh, the wheat crop had uh, mold. For God, yeah. Mold. There was something that, that was affecting. Yeah, that was a popular theory in the 1970s that there was, a, I think, ergot was the name of the mold or spores in the wheat that can make you have a hallucination. And that's kind of been debunked, that, that theory. Um, but I, I think it's, you don't have to go that far to explain the kind of fear that people had in Puritan New England. They were Calvinists. To them, I mean, they, their destiny had been determined by God long before the world was created. You didn't know. Puritans believed that only a tiny percent, maybe 1%, 2% of the world's population got to go to heaven. Everybody else was eternal damnation. There was no way for you to know for sure which one you were. You simply had to observe your life. If you lived a good life, it's probably an indication that you may go to heaven. So Puritans were really introspective. They worried constantly, constantly about whether they were saved or not. And it, it, the devil was real, they believed it, and it, the devil was always there tempting them. Very, you know, very real thing. They were consumed with fear. I remember reading a diary of a Puritan minister, whose name I forget, whose five-year-old son died. He writes in his diary, I know God took my son because I play too much chess. That's tragic. That's very sad, but very typical of how the Puritans thought. Yeah. How old was Ann Putnam Jr. when she died? Ann Putnam Jr. was... She was in her 30s when she died. Yeah, she was probably 34 when she died. Yeah. 
All right, thank you again. Happy Halloween. <laughs>